Welcome back to the channel. In this video, I will review the DOAC and Warfarin drug class and provide some differences between them and when you would use one over the other. If you end up learning anything from this video, please hit the like button. Thank you. DOACs are also known as direct oral anticoagulants, and here are the drugs that fall under this category. Rivaroxaban, Apixaban, Edoxaban, and Betrixaban, which is the newest member of this team. The Bucatrin is in a different color because it's slightly different in terms of the mechanism of action, which we will discuss later. Warfarin is all by itself, and the most common brand of Warfarin is known as Coumadin. Coagulation is not all that bad. It's actually part of our natural healing process to stop blood loss. So in the presence of an injury like a cut, one of the first things that occur is activation of the clotting factors. Vasoconstriction also occurs to move blood away from the site of injury. Platelets would then aggregate to the site to form a platelet plug to stop the bleed. These two things that occur are known as the primary homeostasis. The problem is the platelet plug is not strong enough to secure damage, so then the secondary homeostasis kicks in when the clotting factors go through their enzymatic activities and make the final product, fibrin. Fibrin is a mesh-like protein that will hold the platelet plug in place, making it stronger. So unlike antiplatelet drugs that focus on preventing platelet aggregation to the injury sites, anticoagulants focus on preventing the formation of the fibrin by inhibiting specific clotting factors. By the way, check out my video on antiplatelets versus anticoagulants to learn more about the differences between the two. First, the DOAX. The clotting cascade occurs through two separate pathways, the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway. So the intrinsic pathway is activated by internal damage to the vessel wall, and extrinsic is activated by external trauma. After activation, these pathways go their separate ways and interact with different clotting factors. But then they unite downstream to form the common pathway, which starts with factor 10A. 10A will then convert prothrombin into thrombin, and then thrombin will convert fibrinogen into fibrin, which once again holds the platelet plug together. DOACs such as rivaroxaban, apixaban, edoxaban, and bretrixaban works by inhibiting factor 10A, while the bigotrin inhibits thrombin. Because of this, the bigotrin is sometimes known as a direct thrombin inhibitor. To appreciate the mechanism of warfarin, we need to learn about the production of clotting factors. The clotting factors are produced by the liver. For the purpose of this video, since we are learning about warfarin, we will focus on the clotting factors that require vitamin K for production, specifically the active form of vitamin K. The vitamin K we get from our diet is inactive and gets converted to the active form by vitamin K epoxide reductase complex. With the help of the active vitamin K, the liver can produce the specific clotting factors and also protein C and S, which is our body's natural anticoagulants. Protein C and S inhibits factors there's five and eight. Warfarin inhibits vitamin K epoxide reductase complex through this mechanism. Warfarin can deplete functional vitamin K reserves and thereby reduce the synthesis of the clotting factors listed here, including protein C and S. Now, remember that protein C and S are part of our natural anticoagulation, so inhibition of the production actually promotes clot formation. Because of this, we must bridge warfarin when starting initially. Warfarin bridge refers to the use of parenteral anticoagulants until full anticoagulation by warfarin is achieved. And that's because of the inhibition of protein C and S, which leads to an initial hypercoagulable state. So if patient is taking warfarin today, it would take about five days to get full anticoagulation by warfarin. So during the five days, when patient is not fully anticoagulated, we have to fix this problem. To fix this, we would just start another anticoagulant the same day as warfarin. So heparin or low molecular weight heparin, such as enoxaparin. This would give warfarin the time it needs to kick in while we cover the patient from the underlying condition plus the hypercoagulable state of warfarin. 
So specifically, guidelines recommend to continue the combination for at least five days, and also the INR is therapeutic for 24 to 48 hours. Later on in this video, I will discuss what the INR is, so don't worry. Now that we understand the mechanism of the DOAX and warfarin, I think it's the perfect time to learn about the different indications. By the way, if you think I'm doing a good job explaining this topic so far, please hit the like button and subscribe. Greatly appreciated. Thank you. So I will only focus on the FDA approved indications. DOACs are used to treat deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism, and also for prevention of recurrent DVT and PE. This does not apply to bertrixaban, and for edoxaban, it's only for treatments. They are also indicated for stroke prevention in patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation, but this does not include bertrixaban. Next, DOACs are used to prevent thromboembolism after total hip or knee replacements, and this does not apply to edoxaban and bertrixaban. Lastly, for for prevention of thromboembolism in hospitalized acutely ill patients, that's only for rivaroxaban and batrixaban. Keep these indications in mind as we move to warfarin now. Warfarin is used as treatment for DVT and PE, and also for the prevention of recurrent DVT and PE. It's also used for prevention and treatment of stroke associated with atrial fibrillation. Very different from the DOAX, which are only used for the prevention of stroke associated with non-valvular atrial fibrillation. It's also used for the prevention and treatment of clots associated with cardiac valve replacements. And lastly, warfarin is used for the reduction in the risk of death, recurrent MI, and thromboembolic events after MI. Since these drugs share similar indications like prevention of stroke and AFib and treatment of DVT-PE, let's take a look to see what the guidelines say about when to use one over the other. For prevention of stroke in patients with non-valvular AFib, the American Heart Association and the American College of Chest Physicians recommend DOACs over warfarin. For the treatment of DVT and PE, the guidelines, the American College of Chest Physicians, also recommend DOACs over warfarin. Now, overall, these guidelines slightly prefer DOAC because across all trials, they have demonstrated superiority or non-inferiority to warfarin, with a faster onset, less monitoring required, and also better side effect profile, specifically the bleeding risk. Bleeding risk referring to serious life-threatening bleeds such as intracranial hemorrhages and GI bleeds. Between DOACs and warfarin, most research studies have shown that warfarin has a higher bleeding risk, while others have concluded that they have similar bleeding risk. These studies also specified that reduction in the bleeding risk compared to warfarin does not apply to rivaroxaban. Apixaban, on the other hand, is recognized as the DOAC with the least bleeding risk. Now, aside from these interesting facts that I provided, there are other clinical pearls that can impact real-life clinical and practical decisions when managing these patients. For the DOACs, always check the patient's renal function and dose adjust as needed. Contrary to what we are normally used to, edoxaban is actually contraindicated in patients with a cranial clearance over 95. The reason is that in the trials, patients with cranial clearance over 95 experienced more strokes, so that recommendation is for patients using edoxaban specifically for the prevention of stroke and non-valvular AFib, not the other indications. The proposed mechanism behind this is that the patients cleared the drug so well that they didn't get the full benefits of it. To piggyback off this, for patients on dialysis, Apixaban and rivaroxaban are the DOACs that have been recommended by most guidelines. These agents also go through the cytochrome 450 and interact with P-glycoprotein enzymes. So they will interact with a lot of drugs because of this, both inhibitors and inducers. Make sure you always check for a drug interaction before approving and dispensing DOACs. The bigger trend does not go through the liver, so it has little to no interaction with the CYP enzymes, but it's still significant when it comes to the P-glycoprotein enzyme interactions. I have two separate videos explaining how the CYP450 and the P-glycoprotein enzymes work. I will include the link above for you to check it out. Also, because these agents are metabolized by the liver, caution should be exercised when using it in patients with hepatic impairments. Lastly, Rivaroxaban 15 mg and 20 mg tablets should be taken with food because of improved bioavailability. For patients with severe renal and or hepatic disease, 
Please monitor them closely for bleed and while on warfarin. Because warfarin is so unpredictable with its level of anticoagulation, we have to monitor this. We do this by checking the INR, which I will discuss more next. Research has also shown that genetic variation influences drug metabolism and response to warfarin therapy. Because of this, the package insert includes dosing recommendations based on expression of CYP2C9 and also vitamin K epoxy reductase complex, since there are certain patients who may express more levels of these enzymes. Warfarin has significant drug-drug interactions, so always check this. Because its mechanism is also associated with clotting factors that need vitamin K to be active, foods with vitamin K can impact the level of anticoagulation also. Both of these classes of drugs are typically avoided in pregnancy. The preferred anticoagulation in these patients are heparin and low molecular weight heparin. Now because warfarin has a delayed onset, unpredictable metabolism, and the genetic influence, the therapeutic effect has to be monitored closely. This is done by monitoring the international normalized ratio, also known as INR. It tells you how long it takes for the blood to clot. It's pretty much the same as the prothrombin time, but it accounts for the variations in the reagents utilized in the labs to test for this, which was leading to fluctuations in the normal ranges. So it was standardized as the INR. The higher the INR, the higher the anticoagulation effect and increased bleeding risk. The lower it is, the more prone the patient is to clots. The INR comes in different ranges based on the indication of the warfarin, but usually it's between two and three. When you do the blood test and the INR is in range, it means you have achieved the most appropriate anticoagulation effect. No need to increase or decrease the dose. If the INR is low or blood is clotting fast, it can be due to an increase in the amount of foods that contain vitamin K that the patient is eating, such as green leafy veggies like kale, spinach, parsley, etc. This vitamin K will help the liver make more of those clotting factors going against warfarin's effects. If the INR is high or blood is taking too long to clot, it can be because the patient has reduced their normal intake of vitamin K containing foods. It's okay for patients to eat vitamin K foods while on warfarin, but it's important to counsel them to keep it consistent. Do not increase or decrease the amounts on a weekly basis. This will allow us to only focus on increasing or decreasing the dose to achieve the INR that we want because the other factor, which is the vitamin K from the diet, is held constant. So when the INR is high in this case, you can reduce the dose of the warfarin. If the INR is low, you can increase the dose of the warfarin. Increase the total weekly dose by 5-20% to until the desired effect. If the INR is off by a small value, such as 0.1, you don't need to adjust. Just continue current dose. And warfarin is dosed once a day, so you can also skip doses when the INR is really, really high, like above 4.5. Dosing warfarin is an art, and it requires experience, so it's hard for me to provide you textbook way of monitoring the INR. The INR levels can be obtained in minutes using rapid test kits. Lastly, the INR should be checked 3-5 to five days after dose adjustments or initiation if it's the patient's first time. Once the patient has had two consecutive INRs in the target range, the INR can be measured at increasing intervals. And that will be all folks. I hope you learned something from this video. And if you did, please hit the like button and show your supports. Also subscribe and leave questions and comments down below. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Pharmacist Academy. Thank you for watching this video and take care.